got to redo this here. Sorry about that. Don't worry. We are live and recording. Welcome, everyone. And Judy, just so you know, we do have 1,119 attendees joining us today. Woohoo! I love Dr. Bruce. Alrighty, it's five minutes to the hour and we've opened the, the Zoom webinar up. Uh, this afternoon we have Dr. Uh, doctor, I'm making you a doctor again, Judy. <laughs> Judy K. Massoff. Uh, we'll give her a formal introduction as we hit the hour, but I just wanted to welcome everybody to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay at Home, Stay Healthy CE program. This is free CE that uh, we've gone out and we've asked some of our friends in the dental world if they would donate their time and we've had tremendous response. So big uh, thank you to everybody that is sharing their time with us. Uh, you've become good friends over the years and we look forward to getting you back into the Northwest here once uh, things settle down. Um, like to thank our sponsors, the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentists and Prosthodontics, the UW uh, School of Dentistry, Academy of General Dentistry Student Chapter, Comet USA, uh, University of Washington School of Dentistry, CE, and our local dental societies. We've got Seattle King County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, and Snohomish County Dental Society supporting us, as well as Patterson Dental. We've already had one webinar today, and it was just absolutely excellent with Dr. Leanne Brady. For those of you that were on the webinar earlier and were asking about a recording, that will be on our YouTube channel within the next day or so. So uh, that's Washington Academy of General Dentistry, and that's on YouTube. All these webinars that we are doing are going to be available on YouTube for a period of time. So uh, please, if you miss something, um, it's there. If you're interested in attending some of our upcoming webinars, please go to the Washington agd.org that's our website or you can use the qr codes that are coming up on each of the flyers uh, that you're seeing on your screen uh, we're adding new content every day actually in the middle of the day uh, so uh, keep coming back keep taking a look at what we have going on we have lots of great clinical ce but we also have some great speakers coming up for both our hygienist, assistant, front desk, the, the whole team. So uh, we're fortunate tomorrow, Wednesday morning, we are going to have the Braves are going to be back talking about COVID-19 update on relief provisions and the question back in business May 18th. So uh, that
that was really well received last time and they're going to update us again. So uh, we invite you to uh, come and see that webinar tomorrow. Also, after this webinar at three o'clock today, uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Dr. Kevin Queechen is going to be uh, focusing on identifying and refining your core systems well away from the office. Uh, this is uh, just gonna be uh, great information. Uh, Kevin's so passionate, you're gonna love him. All righty, uh, next week uh, highlights. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Tazir uh, Suleiman on Tuesday, April 21st. Oh, and this Friday, John Nosti is going to join us on Friday afternoon. I know there was a little bit of a trouble trying to get registered for his course. I think we've got that all ironed out. So, uh, yeah, this is a brilliant presentation. I caught this in uh, Chicago in February, uh, probably one of the last live CE events I saw. So, uh, uh, yeah, you'll want to join us on Friday this week as well. I uh, want to remind you, Dr. Yassine is starting his Implant Study Club. Uh, first um, session is this Friday, April 17th, from 2 o'clock to 2 o'clock p.m., pardon me, from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock p.m. Dr. Yassin is going to be hosting guests each uh, time and for discussions regarding different implant study club uh, topics. So uh, that's one you'll want to check out. Uh, he's uh, been doing a series of uh, hands-on CE uh, for implants here at the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. If you go to our website, again, you'll find that in our master track and our CE offerings. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to getting that back up and running again after the COVID-19 uh, crisis has uh, uh, passed. So it's one o'clock right now, and I'm just going to take a quick look and see how many we've got logged on here. We've got about uh, 550, uh, and that number's clicking up. We've got over 1,100 registered, so we'll just take a, a minute or two. A lot of people that are new to Zoom, it's going to take them uh, a minute or so to navigate uh, through the updates and the uh, Zoom um, platform. So... Again, uh, we want to really say thank you to all our sponsors here today. Those sponsors include the University of Washington School of Dentistry, CE, the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics, Comet USA. We also have uh, Patterson Dental and our dental societies, Seattle King County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, and Pierce County Dental Society. Thank you for getting the information regarding these webinars out to uh, dentists and uh, their staff. We greatly appreciate it. Just a reminder, this CE is open to all participants. Uh, you do not need to be a member of the AGD. Uh, we would encourage you to join. It's a great organization. And for you young dentists out there that were looking for uh, affordable CE, uh, to become a member of the AGD for the first year out of dental school is $78. So I don't know too many other organizations that the, the bar is that low uh, to attend uh, or become a member. Uh, again, uh, if you have any questions or people uh, that you would like us to ask to do a webinar, please send us an email at info at washingtonag.org. Um, QR codes are on all the flyers that should help you with the registration. Uh, but if you, you're not having luck with those QR codes, again, go to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry website and most of our course listings are there. I'm sorry, we're adding stuff so quickly sometimes, we're not getting them up instantly. But uh, check back and hopefully uh, we can get you signed up for uh, some great CE. We've got events for the next couple of weeks here uh, and we invite you to join us. So with that, I think it's probably time to uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, 
you know, so many of us know this lady. Uh, uh, you know, some people, you go into the room and they suck the energy out of the room. This, this lady, she puts energy into a room. I, I tell you, when you walk in there, you're, you're just getting hit with a, a wall of positive energy. Uh, Judy, I, I wore my tie here today for you. Uh, I know you love orange. I'm a big fan of orange as well. So let me uh, just read your biography really quick, and then we'll get rolling. Sounds great. Judy K. Massoff is a speaker, author, dental cultural specialist with an expertise in helping others get happier and more successful. She coaches dentists and their teams to become better leaders, communicate positively and effectively, work better together, and deliver service with more focus and passion, resulting in growing their practice. Judy Kay is the past president of the National Speaker Association, Minnesota chapter, a member of the National Speakers Association, Academy of Dental Management Consultants, and director of sponsoring partners for the Speaking Consulting Network. She is the author of three books, Ta-da, Get Happy in Five Seconds or Less, Rise and Shine, and An Evolutionary Journey to Get Out of the Way and On Your Way to Success, and delivering wow surface, service. People will forget everything except how you made them feel. A contributing author also to many dental publications. Judy Kay lives in Minnesota with her awesome husband, Steve, who makes her special coffee every morning. And her It's All About Me, seven pound Yorkie Zoe. Welcome, Judy Kay. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm excited to do a webinar and helping out and and um with this uh with your ce and helping with people you know not being able to gather so this is the next best thing so happy yes. to be here yeah. thank you very much and you know I, I you know it was so great that you threw some other names out uh to us uh would you maybe just mention lois and janice uh, for me please well i I'm, I'm blessed to have some amazing friends in the industry you know you're on the road well at least we were on the road all the time and your friends become your friends who you see on the road and so lois banta is going to be presenting on systems and strategies um, uh, in the future and um, janice is going janice hurley is a good friend of mine she is the image expert and uh, uh great on on how to portray confidence and leadership and um, too many things to list, but they're phenomenal speakers and they're phenomenal friends. So you're going to really enjoy them. Well, thank you. And welcome. Are we ready to rock and roll? We're ready to go. All right. Let's, let, let's see how I do with technology, shall we? <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm still an old dog at this. So, so today is really all about wow service and, um, I decided to speak on wild service today because I think it's going to be more important than ever when we get back in to our new norm, whatever that'll be, that um, that our service reflects well and that we take good care of our patients. Um, as uh, Dr. Timmy mentioned, I live in Minnesota. He almost had that O in you there, Timmy, and and um, we're uh, we have we're blessed to have the Mall of America. Well, maybe for husbands it might be cursed, but for those of us that love to shop, the Mall of America is pretty amazing. Nordstrom's is is one of their um, anchor stores, and it happens to be one of my favorite places to shop because of their service. Yeah, I think about uh, running in there on a not too long ago when things were still back in the norm um, shopping excursion, and uh, actually it was just to pick up a thing, but you know how one thing leads to more. And there happened to be this amazing display of three mannequins. And on the center mannequin was this gorgeous leopard jacket. And those of you who know me well know that after orange, leopard is my next favorite color. And I thought to myself, you know, I have to have that. And evidently I didn't think it because the, the Nordstrom employee that was standing next to me says, well, I think you do too. So I said, well, could you tell me where could I find that? And she said, oh, better yet, let me help you. And she proceeded to take me up, um, right up the escalator with me and take me over to the rounder where it was. And she helped me try it on and it fit. And I said, oh, I'm going to take this. And we went to the checkout and I said, could you please make sure that this lovely lady gets credit for this sale? And, and the checkout person said, oh, I'm sorry, miss. She said, she's not a sales associate. She is our display person. 
She never once said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I'm only in display or it's up over there. She said those magic words, I can help you. It's those little simple things that make the biggest difference for most of us when it comes to service about being present and, um, and tuned into. So wow is not as you would imagine, like, wow, this is amazing. This is over the, over the top. Wow is actually um, a philosophy that I came up with from working with so many demo practices nationwide. I work with them in a culture camp type of experience. It's a two day experience. And um, the first day is observations. And what I noticed is that most teams do a really, really great job of delivering service. And there's maybe just a couple things here or there that if they tweaked would make the biggest difference in their patient experience. And so WOW is actually an acronym, and I might as well confess right now I'm an acronym addict. WOW is an acronym for weed out the weeds. So a weed is anything, and I just want to clarify, it's not that kind of weed, just make sure we know that it, it is, is anything that would make your patients feel uncomfortable or unwelcome, and now more than important than ever, unsafe. It's something that could potentially destroy a relationship. So when we're thinking about delivering exceptional service, that wow service, we always want to keep at the top of our mind, are we making our patients feel comfortable? Are we making them feel welcome? Are we making them feel safe? And are we building on that relationship? So let's talk about how we can get rid of some of those weeds, that potential weeds in our practice. Because um, it's really time to get rid of those and pull those weeds. There's something called the peak end rule. And what that is, it's that people judge their experience by how they felt at the most intense moment or the peak moment and at, at the end, the final experience. And the rest is usually forgotten. Most of us excel at that welcome and we greet people and we escort them in and we take them on a tour sometimes on the new patients and we do all these over the top things. But the checkout on the way out, that's usually where we drop the ball. We have a tendency to be less than. It's kind of like it's the end. Just remember that the end is actually even more important in some cases than the beginning because that's the final thing they remember. We're going to go into that a little bit more further um, in, the, in the next few slides. So it's really important that that end experience be exceptional. And usually that end experience has something to do with financial and collecting the payment. So we want to make sure that we're very confident and comfortable in that role, whoever is doing that in your practice, to make sure that's an exceptional experience. So let's start out by talking about wow impressions. That's actually a picture of my husband, Steve, with our niece, Riley. And that first wow impression, that first impression happens in the first 15 seconds. And that first 15 seconds, we're deciding, is this going to be good or bad? Am I going to like this? Am I not? How do I feel like that, about it? And after those first 15 seconds, it's either positive or negative. And once we make a decision, we look for things to reinforce what we already believe. So if we have a positive first impression, anything neutral becomes positive. And we look for things that were neutral now are a positive experience. However, if that first impression was negative, anything neutral, becomes negative. And we look for things to reinforce that it was negative. The hard part is, is it takes 12 positive experiences to make up for one unresolved ne negative experience. So it's so important that we make sure we invest that energy and time in making that positive first impression. And when we think about impressions, think about sensory. Think about what do they see, hear, touch, smell, and taste. And I'm going to add a sixth sense, is it convenient? Because we are such a convenient society in this day and age. We want everything instantaneous. And I think we've all had to learn about how to slow down a little bit because not everything is easily accessible right now. But even um, you look at Walgreens on every corner because you maybe only want to turn one way versus the other. Or the gas stations within a couple blocks, everything is so convenient. Our phones, if they don't work immediately, there must be something wrong. 
I think back of the dial up years, my gosh, you could, you could dial someone, go on the internet, you could walk away, come back five minutes later and you were still barely getting on. But when you got on, there actually wasn't even anything there to be on for anyway. But this day and age, that would never survive. If we don't have instant results, we're like, oh, there's something wrong, it must be broke. So convenience, when we're looking at creating that positive first impression, Convenience is just as important as what they see, what they hear, what they touch, what they smell, and what they taste. So let's talk about a couple of those patient experiences. For example, the initial phone call. Now, the initial phone call isn't going to um, utilize, you're not going to utilize all of those six senses. Um, you're, you're not going to see anything, but boy, are you going to hear what do you hear when that person answers the phone? How do they sound? Do they sound like they're happy to be there? Do they sound warm and welcoming? I remember when I started in dentistry in the early 80s and um, Pride was our consulting company and actually Amy Kirsch was our consultant. I call her Mama Duck now. We run into each other often. And I remember I was hired as the receptionist because there weren't any scheduling coordinators back then. And she said, Judy Kay, you are director of first impressions. You're the receptionist here. And there, there's no internet to search you out there. Maybe just the little yellow pages ad, that was it, right? So she said, it's really important that you make that positive first impression. And to do that, there are a couple things that you need to do every time you answer the phone. She said, whatever you're doing, when that phone rings, you stop doing it and you focus on answering the phone. And she said, and then before you pick up the phone, I want you to look into this tooth-shaped mirror, which she had attached to my desk. And she said, and I want you to smile. Because when you smile, your voice sounds so much warmer than when you don't. So it's silly to this day when I answer my phone, I smile before I answer the phone because it's such a habit. So when you think about that, that initial phone call, they're not gonna see what they hear. Um, they're not going to smell, taste, touch, but how convenient do you make it for them to be able to schedule? For some of you, it's like going through Fort Knox, you know, and when you're making it easy for them, easy yes questions and how, how did you hear about us and build some rapport. All of those things are so important on that initial phone call. Um, the next experience is your check-in experience. And things are going to change a lot for a check-in experience. I want you to think about now about some safety strategies about what we're going to be doing to help make our patients feel more comfortable and safer when they're coming into our practices when we do go back to work. You know, thinking about the changes that are gonna be, for example, you may end, um, end up implementing an automated wellness screening, answering or asking those questions like, have you been out of the country? Have you been ill within the last couple of weeks? Have you um, been around anybody who's been in the last couple of weeks. And the more you can be automated, the more it will free up your team as well. Also, you wanna look at other things. So think about low touch or no touch as well, which is gonna be really important. So I think about my good friends at Care Credit, they have a custom apply link where your patients can apply online so that they can um, have everything set financially or they can pay like we're doing a lot of teledentistry is starting to um, be a part of what we're doing during this pandemic and it's really important that you're able to be able to collect the money so that's also another opportunity they have a custom pay link so look at things that you can implement that are touchless, that are pre before the patient even comes in the door so you're set so it's less contagious, um, less touch, um, easier for them to be able to come in and feel safe as well. So we wanna think about that paper, paperless and touchless. Also think about your um, mobile app communications. You know, uh, thankfully, technology is growing extremely fast right now to accommodate some of the limitations that we currently have. And there are many different companies out there. Many of us have used them for years for electronic confirmations, but many of those companies now are working with a way in that you can communicate with your patients uh, via schedule, everything like that through your mobile app. And they can as well, which is wonderful. Um, also, when you look at the teledentistry, 
Now, you're not going to do treatment that way, but screening your patients beforehand. Um, and I know from state to state, and this is definitely not my expertise, but from state to state, I know it, it differentiates. And I know that for right now, that a lot of the states are lessening some of their guidelines to allow you to do um, some pre-screening um, to know whether you do need to um, invite that patient into your practice or whether there's someone that you can schedule for later. It's also a great relationship building opportunity for you and your patients or for future new patients to see that face and to get to know that person and build that relationship before they ever come in. So those are some huge things when we look about the check-in experience. Also, once they're in your practice, um, really reinforcing, the, I mean, I don't know how many times I've seen it, the hand wash on TV and every commercial, wash your hands for 20 seconds. It's going to be so ingrained for many of us, but I think it's going to reassure our patients if we have signage up that says like, wash your hands, sanitize your hands here in the directions. You know, I think about when traveling all the time, simple little things to make the, the um, traveler feel like the room is clean. For example, they put the little oh, cardboard doily over the glass to make it look like it's fresh. You know, who knows how, how long the doily has been there, but nevertheless, it's, it's that impression. So like hand wash, sanitize signage, that's going to be important. Um, we may even have things like floor decals to keep it, um, to keep our, our social distancing. Um, I prefer to call it physical distancing, but whatever. And, you know, so those are some things to help our patients feel safe when they come back into our practices as well. And I know that's going to continue to grow and change as we go through, um, through these uncharted waters for sure. Um, so when we think about those experiences, that initial phone call and that check-in experience. And um, think about also the clinical office experience as well. What do they see, hear, touch, smell, and taste? Is it, and is it convenient? And then you also have the consultation room experience. What do they see, hear, touch, smell, and taste? Is it convenience? And especially that checkout experience, because that's the part where they're going to decide. That's that end experience. And make sure that they're very confident and comfortable, um, whoever is in that position, where they can have those uh, open and uh, confident conversations with the patient so that it's a good experience for the patient. And this is a great opportunity to take time and role play some of these conversations as well. What are your team members saying to your patients? What does that flow look like? And look for any potential weeds. Again, anything that would make your patients feel uncomfortable or unwelcome or possibly destroy a relationship. So all of these experiences, all five of these experiences, if you go through and have like a webinar with your team or a Zoom call with, excuse me, a Zoom call with your team and discuss where are the potential weeds weeds and some of our processes, it will really help you um, fine tune and tweak those less than experiences so that when you do come back and you're regular, um, to your regular schedule, you're going to be ready to rock and roll. Um, so those are the, that's that first impression. Your brand is your lasting impression and your brand is so important because it's who you are, it's who you say you are and what your patients experience consistently. And consistently is the key word. When we think about a brand, it's really your reputation. It's what builds loyalty. You know, I think about the companies we're loyal to, the services we're loyal to. Um, it's because they have a specific brand. In fact, they probably have said it over and over so many times that it's ingrained. We repeat the same words they say about their brand. You know, I think about a brand that I love is, is um, Heinz Ketchup. I love Heinz ketchup. It's one of, I don't eat any other ketchup and I'm loyal to it. When I go to the grocery store, I don't look at what other ketchups are next to it. I don't decide, should I eat, should I buy this or this, this time? It's strictly, it's, I'm just kind of zeroed in. It's Heinz ketchup. It's it. I don't even look for new and improved. I want the original, right? I like the texture. I like the taste. I like that it's thick. You can put it on the end of a fry. You can talk with it. It stays on. <laughs> I love all those things. I want you to think about the brands that you're loyal to, the brands that you don't even think about. It might be a Tide detergent. It might be your, your iPhone. It might be um, your computer type. It might be um, a, your, your peanut butter. Who knows? But when you go to the store, think about your experience when you go shopping. 
you don't even look at the other brands because you're loyal to your brand. And that's what we want our patients to think about us. We want to define a brand that's so clear that when our patients describe it, they say the same words we want them to say about us, that they're loyal. They know what we stand for. And that's how you get that loyalty. If you're trying to be all things to all people, you really become very washed um, washed out. It becomes very um, muddy. They don't know really what you stand for. So you can't be a hundred things. So when, I'm going to go back to, to ketchup here for a second. If Heinz ketchup only made a new and improved, I would try it if I couldn't get the old, the original. But if it wasn't as good, if it wasn't everything I'd hoped for, that's when I would be open to trying any new ketchup. And I think about just like our patients, they're very loyal to us until we stop delivering what they are expecting us to deliver. And that's when they start looking for a new dentist, if they're going to consider it. It's not because somebody new comes in, some say shiny and bright new comes in the neighborhood. It's because we've stopped delivering what they thought we were delivering. So really important that we are um, consistent with who we are who we say we are and what our patients experience consistently. And it's really important to come up with those core value words, choose four core value words to help you do that. And that will help you make a difference in that loyalty. Who do you want to be? And pick those words, doctors, that's led by you. What you want your patients to say about you. Because if you don't define it to your team, how could you possibly recreate it in experiences? They can't just read your mind. So really important that you define who you want to show up as every day. We talk about moments of truth or those touch points. That's any action that creates a positive or a negative impression in our patient's minds. So that's anything that would help them decide whether they want to come and see us. Um, how do they feel about us? It could be, for example, um, your business card, you hand it off to someone else to give. Maybe somebody hands your business card to somebody else. What does it say about you? Is it a pretty mediocre bland or does it really show a little bit more about your personality where they can make a judgment? Is it something that someone might say actually? Or you even think about your signature on an email. All of those are touch points. All of those make impressions. Anything that represents you that is not you is a is that touch point or moment of truth that makes an impression in the patient's mind. So always be thinking about that as well when you're putting together things to support. And then does it support my brand? Does it support those core values that we're talking about? So we talked about first is sensory, lasting is brand, and then the third is the moments of truth, your ongoing representation or your touch points. Those are the things to reinforce why you. You know, I laugh about it. Um, Dr. Timmy wore his orange tie for me. I'm really appreciative of that, right? I have orange in the background of my, um, my flowers that we need it here in Minnesota. We're having another snow flurry today. I can't believe it. We had six inches or seven inches the other day. And it's April. We want to go, no, no more snow, you know? So, but that's my brand, the orange, the positivity, the colors. And so when I look at that, that's another touch point to reinforce uh, my brand. Think about what your brand is and, and work and uh, discuss that with your team about what you need to do to help reinforce your brand to your patients as well. So I can't do this without introducing you to our, our little dog named Zoe. She's uh, 14 years old and who knows, you may or may not hear her bark sometime throughout this. I don't pay her enough to keep her quiet. So we'll see where, how she does on that. But that's Zoe and she, um, she's a uh, a uh, six and a half pound Yorkie who pretty much runs our household. And when she looks at you like that, with that face, it's kind of hard to say no to. So, but yes, she, she does run our household. Um, those of you who have dogs know exactly what I mean. Well, so we talked about impressions. I want to spend the rest of our time talking about wow service standards. Really important that we, number one service standard is we're happy to serve. Number two, consistency uh, with our team, our service, our treatment. Number three, we focus on what's in it for the patient. 
Number four, we work together well. And number five, we create an awesome ambiance. So we're gonna go a little deeper into all of those. Uh, so let's start with happy to serve. I want you to think about it. Is everybody on your team happy to serve? Think about that. If not, the question becomes, if you're one of the people who is not happy to serve, you have to question, why are you there then? Maybe there's something else you'd rather do. Because it's important. We need to be happy to serve. Our patients, when they come to see you, I don't know if you realize this, but most people don't like going to the dentist. They may like to see you, but it's not like, yay, get to go to the dentist today. You know, Most of them are like, ooh, okay, I have to go, I have to, go to the dentist today. So they want someone that is happy to serve. They don't want to see somebody that comes up front to greet them and looks like this. She's pretty, but she's not smiling. And you know what? The thing is, is most of us don't even realize what our face is doing. So many times we come up to greet the patient if we're a clinical team member or we're even at the front desk and we're welcoming patients. So many times we don't smile, we're focused, we're busy, we're thinking, and our face comes off a little, um, less friendly. I'll, I'll not say anything to do about the face. I'll, I'll just uh, leave that, that B word out. So um, be mindful about what your face is doing. Patients are nervous as a rule. A smile helps make them feel better. Now, she made it a little better. She, there's a tiny bit of a curve here, a little bit of a smirk to help, but still not quite the smile. And as long as we're in the, in the industry of dentistry and taking care of people's teeth, why aren't we showing ours? Wouldn't we much rather go back with someone that's smiling like this? So if you wanna change one thing that would be very simple, you can multitask, it'll make a big difference on how your patients feel, is just start smiling. Just go ahead, practice it right now. It might hurt, some of us haven't done that in a while, right? Just start smiling. So ask yourself, do you seem happy to the people you serve? And the people we serve, includes our coworkers. I have a very strong belief, and this is something that I teach when I'm working with teams in culture camps, is that you must treat each other as well or better than you treat your patients. We always talk about service starting with each other, but most offices that I've worked with have a double standard. They allow their team to treat each other less than than they would ever allow them to treat a patient. And it's interesting how once we change that standard and the expectation is that we must treat each other as well or better, then all of a sudden, a lot of the drama and chaos goes out the door. So be happy. Be happy with the people that when you first walk in the door in the morning. And I'm going to ask you, did you smile today? Maybe you did. Maybe because I asked you to. If not, you could practice it. Did you smile today? It's so important. It'll make you feel better. So smiling, happy to serve. The other part is about making people feel like we're happy to serve is introducing ourselves and, and, and getting to know their name and have, building that rapport with them. Ask them how they would like to be addressed. Please don't make everybody's name shortened. Like if his name is Charles, make sure Charles wants to be a Chuck before you call him Chuck, right? Important to know and use their name often. Um, so many times I think about this as we, we say our name once and we think people are going to remember it. But most of us, if, if you think about it, when you've met someone new just recently, before they even walk away, we've forgotten their name, right? It, it's so difficult sometimes to hang on to names. And name tags a lot of times are hard to read. And a lot of people who have um, a jacket over it or they get folded or, or, or the scripting is really hard to read as well. So make sure you introduce yourself and you say your name more than once because it's hard to hang on to. I think about a oral surgery practice. I do a lot of work with many of the specialties as well as general and oral surgery is one of the larger groups I work with. And I will tell you that it's so funny because they, um, they do a lot of surveys as a rule to find out, um, you know, how the patient's experience was because they not only serve the patient, they serve the referring doctor as well. So they want to make sure that that's exceptional. And they had this one team member named Sandy who got all oh, this great uh, accolades on the survey, Sandy, Sandy, Sandy. And so it was so much, in fact, that the, the doctors were saying to the rest of the assistants, hey, what's going on here? How come Sandy gets all the mention and the rest of you, there's no names mentioned in the rest of you, what's going on? And the team was frustrated. They were like, wow, I don't know, we do everything the same. 
Well, I happened to be there uh, day observing and Sandy did something that was very different than all the rest. They all were kind and treated the patients well and did everything, but she said her name a lot. She would come out and greet the patient. She'd say, good morning, my name's Sandy and I'm going to be working with Dr. Wonderful today and helping him during your, during your treatment today. Um, and then they're walking back and she seats the patient in the room and she's talking to the patient more and she said, if I step out and you have a question, just say, please go and grab Sandy or please ask for Sandy and I'll, I'll make sure I come back. And, and then this um, young lady was having her wisdom teeth extracted. So when she woke up from it, she said, good, you did so well, Susie you did so well. It's Sandy. I, it's here. I'm here. Do you have any questions for me? And then when she went up front to take her to the driver or the parent and go over the post-op instructions, she said, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to call me. My name's Sandy, and I'm just going to write it here on the instructions just in case so you can talk to the person who was actually in um, the op during your procedure. So everybody remembers her name. It's Sandy. Whereas the rest of the team members would say their name once and they thought that was good enough. But truthfully, people don't hang on to names. Just think about how difficult it is for you to remember that. So say your name often, use it often, and say your patient's name as well. Take time to build the relationship. So many times we're rushing and running and now more than important than ever, there's gonna be so many new things that we need to do. We need to slow down and make sure that we're doing things proficiently, not just fast. So if you start hearing things like, no one told me they needed that, or I thought they were doing it, or I didn't collect for it because it wasn't written down, you're probably moving too fast. It's going to be very, very important that we don't sacrifice safety or the patient experience for trying to make up for some open time that we've had while we've been closed down really important. So part of our scheduling may need to change when we start to learn some of the new processes we're need, going to need to do to be able to um, accommodate our patients safely. So there may be more room turnover and there's definitely going to be more talk time doctors and um, providers with your patients to help them feel comfortable in your practices when they come back. So you're going to want to allow a little bit more time in your appointments. So when you think about that, evaluate your appointment timing and allow adequate time for patient communication and room turnover. Otherwise, it's going to feel like you have to move at Mach 10 speed and that's where things are gonna get missed or somebody is gonna feel unsafe or unwelcome or uncomfortable and you create that weed experience. So starting out, we definitely wanna make sure that we're doing that. And then even after that, we can only move at a certain speed. We've gotta slow down in order to do things proficiently in some cases. And so many times I hear, well, I didn't finish that or I didn't do that because I was in a hurry. In a hurry can never be an excuse to compromise. We can only move at a speed of which we can be accurate, detailed, and complete. Because if you're rushing and you miss details or you don't complete or you're inaccurate or you don't communicate pertinent information to someone you're being inefficient. You might think you're being fast, but you're not. Because if it's not done, it's not done, right? So really important when we think about that, of slowing down enough to build those relationships, to do things to make our patients feel welcome and comfortable and safe. And that's how we show our patients that we're happy to serve, we're happy to be there, be present. Number two is consistency. Consistency for every team member, every patient, every visit. We want to make sure that we do things five out of five, you know, with our people, our services, our amenities, our systems and protocols and our transitions that were congruent. So now again is great practice time. You can go through some of your processes. You can review them. You can role play them via um, your, uh, your video, Zoom, and talk about what is it that you do? How do you create that consistency? And always keep your brand in the back of your mind, those core value words. Would this make them feel like maybe one of your core value words is friendly? Would this make our patients feel we're friendly or maybe it's um, excellence would this make our patients feel like we're delivering excellence that helps you plant that seed really important to do that because we want to make sure that we deliver an over-the-top wow experience every time because remember it only takes one bad experience to possibly 
create a disloyal patient. So we wanna focus on really delivering that wow. And the best way to do that is make sure that we under promise and we over deliver. In this day and age, most of the marketing is over promising and under delivering. So patients as a rule, people as a rule, we're skeptical. We don't necessarily trust. Make sure you deliver what you say you're going to do and that's how you're gonna build a really loyal relationship. Be mindful about it. And I know we can't foresee all outcomes, but then we have to be um, transparent about that, about what the risk factor is, what the odds are, what we know, or even what we don't know, you know, and letting that patient be aware of that. Because when you talk about that up front, it sounds like you understand and you're sharing, you're knowledgeable. When you talk about it afterwards and you explain it and you haven't had that discussion, it sounds like an excuse. So always make sure you talk about um, things openly up front. For some of you that know me, you know that I love bread. Absolutely love bread. I am a bread eater. I could forego other food. If I could have bread, balsamic oil, a little wine, I'd have my four food groups. I wouldn't need anything else, right? It'd be pretty simple. <laughs> you count that up, yeah. I think about a time I went to a restaurant and I was there with a girlfriend, um, and this was pre-COVID, let's just clarify. And um, we were sitting there having dinner, and we had a glass of wine first, and we were solving the world's problems as we women do. And uh, uh, the server came over with this amazing bread basket that looked very similar to this. And it had all the great breads and the big crackly breads and the long sticks and the buns and all those wonderful things. I was like in bread heaven. And they not only had that, but they had all of this, the, um, the different spreads as well. I was so excited that, you know, I took most of my entree home to my husband, Steve, because I ate more bread than I needed, you know, to, so I really didn't need the entree. So about two weeks later, I went back and I, with another friend that I knew was a bread lover, and I didn't tell her about it because I wanted it to be a surprise. So we're having our glass of wine, talking about all the stuff going on in our lives. And we ordered and then I'm waiting. I'm so happy my feet are almost swinging underneath the seat, you know, I'm, I'm under the table because I'm like, the bread's coming, the bread's coming, right? Well, all of a sudden, here comes our entrees and the waiter sets them down and he turns and he's about to leave. And I said, oh, excuse me, sir, where's the lovely bread basket? And he said, I'm sorry, ma'am, we don't have a bread person on Tuesdays. Well, I came for the bread. I haven't been back since. So now if they would have managed my expectations, whoever was delivering that wonderful bread basket the first visit and said, today's your lucky day. Today, it's Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. We have a bread person here. So we have these wonderful baskets of bread, right? Then I would have known, okay, if I want bread, I'm going to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The first time it was a surprise, but the next time I came back, I expected it. And when it didn't happen, it was a less than experience and I felt gypped. So when you're going to do something special for your patients, just remember that they're only surprised once. After that, it becomes expected. So it's very important that if you're going to do something that you explain to them up front, if it's, if it's inconsistent, if you only do it on certain days or certain rooms or certain treatment, make sure you preface that when you do it, not as an exp explanation later why you didn't do it. Always keep them informed so they know and they're prepared. Because service is really all about managing expectations, all about managing expectations. And that's the key. And consistency is what helps us manage expectations. Really important. We want to know what's their bread. Very important to have attention to details as well. A lot of food here. I'm thinking, you know, I like food. I'm just going to say. So a lot of food here. Really important that we have attention to detail. And also that we are timely. Time is just as important as money. And I just want to mention something here. I think that this might be Heinz ketchup there. Do you notice how it's standing up? It's not pulled. Like, like if it's Hunts, I think it would have been running all over. Be on time, be on time, be on time. And it's going to be really important when we go back to work to make sure that we evaluate our timing for our appointments so that we can be on time for our patients so they feel confident and comfortable and safe. 
So evaluate that, very important on timely. And that means also starting out your day on time as well. Some of us have a tendency to show up late. Those patients that are there in the morning, they're there for a reason. They want to be in and out. They're the type A personality. I've got places to go, things to do, people to see. So if you can't be on time and doctors, this one's for you. Love you, but I don't love you when you're late. There's no excuse. If it's your practice, if you don't want to show up at eight, then, sh then schedule your appointments for when you want to show up. Be on time, be on time, be on time. Okay, I'm off my soapbox now. We can move on. <laughs> we want to make sure we have a likable team as well. Really important that everybody on the team is likable, not just one person we bring out once in a while from sterilization. That, no, they all need to be a likable team. They need to be able to work well together. It's not a skills versus likability. It's an and not an or. So really important. And very important that we practice as a team that we're, um, in order to be consistent, we have to have practice. And in order to have practice, we have to have time to communicate. So morning huddles, team meetings, all of those things are vital, really important. So practice verbal skills, practice role playing, practice the physical walkthrough to make sure that you're comfortable in doing this so everybody is confident. So you're not practicing on your patients because they're not the guinea pigs, right? I think about um, a, a practice I was working with oh, a couple of years ago and they had decided to start using their consult room again somehow or another to become a closet for a while and <laughs> the storage area and they decided to use it and we talked about the verbal skills we talked about which um, cases were going to be uh, which patients would be taken into um, the consult room we talked about we role played a little bit and i said well now let's do the physical walkthrough and they're like oh no no we're okay gdk and i said no let's let's actually do this and i said so i'll be the patient and i said who else will there be well it'll be the doctor and it'll be the treatment coordinator and i said okay so I said, the rest of the team, bring your notebooks and look for anything that would feel like a weed experience, anything that would feel uncomfortable, unwelcome, unsafe, or impossibly destroy a relationship. So the three of us, we go walking into the consult room and the first thing that we notice is there are only two chairs. So the treatment coordinator goes, oh, just a minute, just a minute. And she runs out and she goes, she gets another chair and she brings it in. And then they have to figure out where to situate, you know, where to put it. And then the computer's in the wrong spot and they move that and the mouse and the pad. <sighs> okay. And we start to talk and I said, well, let's, let's pretend that I don't have a very high dental IQ. Let's pretend that I haven't done much treatment in the past. Um, do you have software to show me the different type of treatment or do you use models or what? Oh, we need the models. She runs out of the room to go get the models and she comes back. And then we're talking a little bit longer. And I said, and let's, let's say that I, um, that I don't, um, I, that I can't afford all of it right away or I don't want to do it all right away. Um, um, how much would this portion be? Oh, she needed a calculator. So by the time we were done, she'd have had to leave the room five times. So really important, very important that we practice the physical walkthrough so that our physical space supports us. And when we talk about going back into our practices now, before you start seeing patients, it's going to be imperative that you practice those, um, your, each of your type of appointments, what you need to do, when, where, why, and how, so that your team feels confident when you start to see patients. It's gonna make a huge difference in how you work in treating your patients when you go through that practice. Don't think you're just gonna come back and start on day one seeing patients that everybody's gonna be comfortable about that with all the different changes that you're going to be implementing. Very important to practice that. Practice verbal skills. How are you going to introduce things in a positive manner, not complaining about it? How are you going to you know, role play so you can Find out what's comfortable to say, and then make sure you do that physical walkthrough. It's gonna make a big difference in being confident coming back. The third is what's in it for the patient. You gotta be thinking about the patient's experience and telling them what you're doing and why. This is where we lose value so many times, especially in recare appointments. Some of us may have been hygienists at the same practice for 30 years, and we've known this patient forever, and we stop telling them what we're doing and why because we think they know this and we spend all the time catching up. Big mistake. Every time you touch a patient, every time you do something, tell them everything you're doing and the purpose that's a patient benefit statement. 
of why you're doing it. That's how you build value. Very, very important. And so practice some of those things. Talk about it. And again, look at how, to, how can we um, have it share more about what can we say that will reflect our brand as well. That's where I was trying to go with that. Really important to do that. We want to make sure we come from a place of care and concern, not judgment and criticism. So many times we have a tendency, you know, we see something in our instant mind, we're like, wow, they, they should have done that or, oh, that's a problem. Make sure that your face doesn't show what's going on internally. Make sure your, your face is, uh, is, is reflecting like your outside, like your outside words, not your inside, or your outside voice, not your inside voice. Um, this is not the time to be judgmental because that'll shut them down even more. For some people, it's a big deal to come to the dental office. So we wanna make sure that they feel comfortable. So important to ask what has been their past experience. What are their goals? It's not just about having perfect teeth. What's important to them? When we start to ask questions about, to patients about that, it makes them feel more in control. It makes them feel comfortable. It makes them feel like they're not being talked at. And then after we go through treatment, we just say to the patients, what questions do you have about today's appointment? Um, and that makes a big difference. It helps them feel comfortable when we're talking about um, what they need. What, do, what questions do you have for me? Because they really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's gonna be important too that we address complications as they happen. And so many times, a lot of us, we hate conflict and we, ooh, it's scary. The sooner we address it, the less time there is for energy to build the less time there is for frustration to build. So make sure you try to take care of it as soon as possible. Magic words, very simple. How may I help you? And then just listen, just listen. And then once they take a breath and they stop, just say, may I have your permission to give you feedback? And this will do two things. Number one, it'll let you know if they're done telling you about their concern because they'll go, well, I'm not done yet. And number two, it will get them ready to listen. And then regardless of what they feel, felt you should have done or shouldn't have done, don't start out by saying, I can't. Start out by saying, I can help you, and this is how. Because the minute you say, I can't, the, the ears shut down, the walls close, and they can't hear anything from that point on. I can help you, and this is how. So many times, little things happen that we, you know, we can't, we can't, um, it's not about perfection, right? So sometimes things happen. Maybe it's difficult for a patient to get numb or somebody has a less than experience. Something happens, you know, those things happen. Wheels fall off sometimes. So it's important that we go into service recovery and that we tell them what we can do right away and that we empower our employees to be able to resolve the concerns um, as soon as they happen versus saying, I need to check into that. Let's make sure we give our team members um, the confidence to be able to say, I can help you. And this is how. Um, we want to make sure too that we go into that recovery whether they complain or not. So maybe, maybe you had difficulty getting a patient numb and the patient doesn't say anything. If you don't say anything to them and say, and if you don't say something, apologize or I'd say, you did really well, I'm sorry, I know it was more difficult for, you had a tougher time getting numb today, this, let them know it's not the norm. Otherwise, they're going to think that's your normal. If you try to avoid it, you know, sometimes you think, ooh, they didn't say anything. I'm not gonna say anything, I'm not gonna bring it up. The problem is, is people don't like conflict. So most people, if they're uncomfortable, they're just not gonna say anything and they just leave. So we wanna make sure we address things as they happen and make sure that we ask the patients if they're comfortable and they feel safe and they feel welcome, or is there anything we could have done differently to help improve their experience? And that will open up that conversation so that we can address the concerns and that they do stay loyal. We wanna make sure we do that. Always show your patients appreciation as well. You know, your patients can go anywhere. So many times we take our existing patients for granted. Oh, that's just Mrs. Jones, she'll be fine. We can just move her here or we can do this. Make sure you really take the time to tell your patients how much you appreciate them. And not just like the flyby, thank you very much, thank you very much, like they do at McDonald's, but more of just really sincere, look them in the eye, shake their hands, someday I think we're gonna do that again, <laughs> and tell them how much you appreciate them. Show them appreciation. The fourth thing we're gonna talk about when it comes to service is working together. 
really important that we work together well, even if we don't like each other. It's our job to play well together. I remember in school, we had report cards, and this is actually a picture of my report card um, on conduct. We were rated on it. And for those of you who don't know, S was for satisfactory. If I'd have came home with a U for unsatisfactory, I'd have been in trouble. <laughs> so an example, imagine, observe school regulations, work some plays well with others, respect for property, respect for authority, is courteous in speech and manner. I think those would be great guidelines for in our practice as well. They could go a long way. Funny how we learn everything by the time we're five and then I think we spend the rest of our life forgetting it, right? <laughs> so important to do that. We want to help each other. We want to support each other. And it's not about whether they work hard enough or fast enough, whether they deserve us to support them because the patient's experience, that's our concern. And if we don't help someone help the patient, then we're letting the patient down. We want to make sure that we own things, that we resolve problems immediately. We say, you know, I can help you. And this is how, even if it means you're taking them, if somebody comes up and says, hey, could you help me with this? Instead of saying, I'm sorry, I don't work in the front, or I'm sorry, I don't work in the back. Say, I can help you. Let me take you to Susie. She is the expert on this. You're still helping them. So own it and help them. Because it's your job as long as it's legal, ethical, and within your licensure. And in this case, it evidently wasn't this person's job to move the tree. It was only their job to paint. So we want to make sure we don't do things like this in our practice and create that negative experience for our patients because it's your job. We want to have fun together as well. Patients love to hear us having fun. They love to know that we're enjoying each other. We know when we go someplace, when a team gets along, that we're going to have great care or we're going to have great service. We've all been to those places where somebody's not getting along and it's really awkward and uncomfortable and your patients can feel that very quickly. So make sure you do things to have fun, to get rid of some of the stress, little things during the day to keep things lively as well. Really important. The fifth service concept we're going to talk about is awesome ambiance. Want to make sure that when our patients walk in that they're like ah, i'm glad i'm here this is a place i want to come to so think about those five senses what do they see here touch smell and taste and is it convenient so an aesthetic and inviting decor make sure that it's up to date make sure that it feels welcoming very important also comfortable we want our patients to feel comfortable so make sure that they feel comfortable in the chairs and um, in the waiting area, reception area, very important. And sparkling clean is gonna be more important now than ever. Sparkling clean, and that means actually policing the bathroom probably every 20 minutes, you know? You're gonna make sure, it's so funny, we can go in there, we can put new toilet paper on. Well, this day and age, you probably couldn't put it on, it would disappear, but <laughs> you put new toilet paper on and, and, and fill up the paper towels and, and clean the mirror, and you can come in 20 minutes later and the toilet paper is out and the paper towels are overflowing and the mirror is spattered because someone decided they better floss because they're finally seeing the hygienist, right? So we wanna make sure that we have a sparkling clean environment as well. Make sure that we do that and that everything is tidy and fresh. Please don't keep dead plants. Some of you have, or you have flowers delivered and the water is murky by the end of the week. If you're going to have um, live flowers or plants and that, make sure that they're well taken care of. Otherwise your patients are gonna think that this happens, this is gonna to happen to them as well. <laughs> I, I think about this plant I used to see in offices, the philodendron. So many of us get those plants in some type of arrangement and they're the dark green little leaf thing. And they, they're the ones that grow the long vine. So you have this pot with a vine that goes maybe 20 feet and on the end is a leaf and the end of the 20 feet is a one leaf. I just want you to know that plant is not alive. It just didn't die all the way. So make sure that your plants are tidy and fresh. We want to make sure it's welcoming and organized. Everything has its place. If you see it, clean it, fix it, remove it, or put it away. Very important. So the five service concepts we talked about today were happy to serve, consistency for team service treatment, focus on what's in it for the patient, work together, and have an awesome ambiance. 
I want to share just a little bit about some things I'm excited as, as um, Dr. Timmy has mentioned, I do have three books. Wow is hot off the press this year. Um, oh, you've got Tada over there, don't you? Um, if you're interested in, in ordering a book, you can go to my website. Um, I do have them available on there. Also, I um, would be happy to send you the service standards and the white pages from today. So if you'd like to email me, you can email me at judyk at practicesolutionsinc.net. Um, also, if you would like to sign up for my monthly newsletter, it's called Show Your Shine. It's full of positive, powerful practice management tips. And you can just sign up right on my website. You can also like me. That sounds so sad, like me needy, right? You can like me on Facebook. I post a positive quote every day, a ray for the day. That's on there. Love, 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 love working with teams uh, in Culture Camp, two-day commitments, um, training opportunities with teams. So if that's something you're interested in, we are going to be back working together and, and someday soon, not too far out, I'm sure. And I also love to do gift seminars for specialty practices for their um, uh, referring doctors as well. Um, something that I'm excited, really excited to share in this time of need is my wonderful husband, Steve, has been an um, engineer working for the uh, sales engineer for um, over 30 years for the same company. And the company that he represents actually has face shields available now. And they are in stock. And so if you're if something you're interested in, you can email me and I will forward it to the company and they, they will take over the conversation from there. And the ex other exciting part is they are working on making sure that these uh, face shields will be able to accommodate loops. And I think those would be loops without the, um, without the light. There is still, they haven't perfected the light part yet, but still loops. So um, if you're interested in face shields, feel free to reach out to me. So I'm excited about that. A big thank you to my husband, Steve, and the company that is working on it. They just trying to help uh, with this uh, pandemic going on right now. So anything you need, um, reach out to me, go to my website. I'd be happy to help you in any way um, and, um, and, and answer any questions that you have. Uh, today, when we're talking about service, I hope that you found it helpful. Um, most importantly, when we think about service, be thinking about being present when you're working with your patients and really listening to them and finding out what matters to them, what's important to them and take care of them in a way where you're answering their questions and fulfilling their needs, because it's really about how we take care of them and how we make them feel and more important than even our treatment that makes a big difference. They're assuming they're getting good treatment. It's how we make them feel is the key because they'll forget everything truthfully, except for how we make them feel. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I'm going to take it back to, um, to Timmy. I'm going to try this here. Yeah. So I need to stop sharing. Sure. There we go. All righty. Thank you very much. Uh, we had a few questions. I wonder if you'd uh, spend a few minutes with sure, us. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, making those slides available uh, via email. That's uh, We get that oh. question quite a bit. People You're want welcome. slides. And, uh, so, and I would encourage you to pick up uh, Judy Kay's books. Uh, uh, it's a nice, easy read. It's a nice book to share with your staff, uh, the, the three of them. So uh, I don't read too many books. My wife loves books, uh, but uh, I have read your book. <laughs> the, well, I made it short enough so it's an easy read. And actually, yeah. each chapter works great for, um, for a separate team meeting topic. So it works out well. Terrific. Let's start with this question. What advice would you give a younger associate dentist that is having a hard time balancing being a leader as, slash assertive with assistance versus being nice and friendly, especially if there's a large age gap. Okay, and that's, and that's a question I, I get a lot. So you can still be nice and friendly. However, it's important to be clear about your expectations as well. So it really is about having conversations and managing those expectations up front as a young associate, just say, you know, I, I really enjoy working with you. I love to have fun and enjoy our time together. However, when we're working and I need something, I'm going to need to have you be able to follow through with that. If our working relationship where if we can't chit chat back and forth and you can't transition from friend 
per se to um, being able to do what I need to do, then there would be a concern. So it's always about managing those expectations up front. You can be friendly, you can have some fun, you can joke around, you can laugh, you know, having lunch together, doing things like that. However, it's really important that they understand that when you're working with patients, that they're, that's critical time. And that's when they need to be able to support and they are a leader and a doctor. So that's what I would suggest. Okay, here's a question. What would be ways for a treating doctor to turn around a patient experience after a procedure that has not gone the way it was planned? I think you have to be transparent. Um, I think you have to be able to say to the patient, I'm really, you know, so here, here our goal, you know, if, if it was, if I had a crystal ball and I, and I, and I could make everything perfect or wave a magic wand and everything could always turn out, um, a certain way that would be great, but you know we're dealing with, I mean, with the mouth and the human, you know, and things things don't always go exactly as planned. So I think it's really important to be able to explain to the patient what happened, and I think it also is important to ask the patient what they feel they're comfortable. You know, what do they feel would be a good solution, or do they have any concerns that they want to share? I think it's more. It's not about us just fixing it. It's about us asking the patient, how do they feel and what could we do um, to help accommodate how they're feeling? It's more of a give and take. It's not, there's, you know, if a patient is saying, you know, if something doesn't go well, I'm, I'm going to acknowledge it to the patient right away. Okay. How do you make role playing not seem silly, <laughs> but important? <laughs> Let's just, it is silly. It feels silly. But it is, it feels awkward, it feels weird. First of all, stop saying, well, I would say, and just say it, and just role play it. You think silly, you should see me standing here doing a webinar talking to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about silly, right? Yeah. Um, so it really is, it's, it's about you practicing. And those of us who speak and do that, we know that if you don't practice something, it doesn't roll off your tongue naturally. If you don't practice a procedure, just like it's awkward and uncomfortable, when you, you think about it as an assistant, when you're first handing off um, instruments or you're first doing this or that, it's awkward until you more practice. Practice makes perfect. So uh, the role playing, it feels, you, the more you do it, the less it does. And you can laugh and go, okay, so, but now let's actually talk about, um, would we say this to a patient? And what, and if you were the patient, how would you respond? And you can't, you can't get crazy. Like some people then do things that are ridiculous. If we're going to role play, we need to role play what would be reasonable. You know, that's, keep it on track. Okay. Uh, what if the doctor functions best when there is no chit chat? chit chat would overwhelm her and the chit chatty patients get upset and eventually leave when the doctor prefers to be professional and not chit chat all the time. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Well, so there's a, there's, there's never an all or nothing, right? There's a happy medium. Um, again, it's about managing expectations. So the assistant or whoever is um, sitting with the patient before the doctor comes in can tee that up a little bit and just say, you know, our, our doctor is very focused when she um, is in the middle of treatment. She has a tendency to be much quieter um, because she's very focused on giving you the best quality of dentistry that you possibly can. So you can kind of, that's managing that expectations up front. The other part is, as doctors, if you're uncomfortable, just remember you still have a human on the other side. <laughs> it's not just about getting it done. So you have to make sure that you seem um, caring and approachable. And if you're behind a mask and, they, and, and loops, they don't see that. They can't see that human side. So a little bit of conversation sometimes is needed to make that patient feel comfortable. So it's a little bit of growth on, on the doctor's side and it's um, um, managing expectations up front. And a team member can do that very easily. You can, you know, you can even say, you know, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but our you know, doctor, she's so good at what she does and she's very focused. So she has a tendency to be quieter during the procedure. But if you have any questions or something like that, please you know, make sure you ask because she's, you know, her, your care is her number one concern. That helps manage that. Uh, how do we get the front office to give us enough time as hygienists? <laughs> Talk and... to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to stop being mad at the scheduling coordinators, okay, or the front desk. If this is time to have a team meeting and discuss it openly. 
Okay, so if 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 the front office is squeezing, as we call them, the front office, they're like, a, if they're squeezing people in where they don't belong because they're trying to fill a hole, then the question has to be is they have to get permission from the doctor that if they can't fill that hole, let's say, because maybe it's an hour and they have 40 minutes, so they try to put that hour in because it's better than nothing. Well, if you're the hygienist, it's not, you know, so it really goes back to, and here's where we're going to go back to the standard of care about consistency. If you do certain things during your hygiene appointment and you, that's your standard of care, then you need to be able to consistently do that. So squeezing someone in and skipping things is not the way to go because that will create a less than experience. And we think our patients will understand it, but they remember, oh, you didn't do this and you didn't do that and you didn't. And then pretty soon they're not on your schedule anymore. So it's really important. We can't shortchange our providers in the time that they need to deliver quality care. And especially now more than ever, because there's going to be more time needed to explain things to the patients about what you're doing for safety. And as far as, and also room turnover, very important. How would you work with a patient who is uptight and timid no matter what you do? Anxiety plays a role, but some people are outright rude. <laughs> oh, we're so blessed. Um, <laughs> I think it really comes down to if you've got a patient that's uptight and you can just say, you, can, um, you may mention, I have a tendency to respond to people. If somebody is uptight, I'll say, are you, you know, how are you feeling right now? And I'll ask them about how they're feeling. Um, and they might say, well, why? And I might, I'll comment, well, you look, um, you look nervous or you look um, um, anxious or how are you feeling right now? And I'm going to ask them how they're feeling. And then I'm going to ask them, is there something you would like me to do differently to help you feel more comfortable? I'm going to put it back in them. Again, it's that conversation. It's not about me trying to throw a bunch of things at the wall to see what sticks and what works. I'm going to ask the 